we developed the idea of the economy of prestige. We, when we think about the economy, we generally think about it in financial terms. There are certain scarce resources which are bought, bought by money. How are those resources distributed? But what's interesting is that in the favelas of Recife, prestige and honor are really limited resources. And what's odd is that it's also passed on. So in fact, the dynamics of the, the prestige economy are very similar to the dynamics of the financial economy in the favela. This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Lenick. You've heard me lament more than a few times on this podcast about the fact that innovation in the social sector is oftentimes synonymous with technology. We talk a lot about how phones and apps and data are accelerating change and opening up opportunities for those in need. And of course, being something of a super geek myself, I admit I love these conversations. But I'm also aware of this narrow focus. And so when I get a chance to highlight other forms of innovation, I pounce. The innovator I'm excited to introduce to you today on our 160th Terms of Reference podcast hasn't created a new technology. Rather, his organization has recognized that prestige is its own type of economy for street kids. So much so that as the opportunity to earn prestige has flourished through their programs, it has literally transformed the lives of tens of thousands of youth across Latin America. My guest is Kurt Shaw. He is the executive director of the Shine a Light Foundation. Shine a Light teaches digital arts, think video, movie making, audio storytelling, to marginalized children all over Latin America. And as you'll hear in our discussion, their work has had serious, measurable impact on street kids in many different countries. Perhaps the quality I enjoy the most about this conversation with Kurt is his humility and recognition that he and Shine a Light are facilitators that helped unlock potential, and the kids they work with are the real inspiration. So much so that their movies, art, comics, books, and other productions have won several awards, locally and internationally. I spoke with Kurt in Florianopolis. But before we dive into the show, here's a quick word from our sponsor. The Terms of Reference podcast is sponsored by International Solutions Group, helping to improve the social impact of governments, UN agencies, NGOs, and companies for more than 10 years. Visit ISG online at www.theisg.com. Hello, Kurt. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Thanks for having me, Stephen. It's really nice to talk to you. Where do we find you sitting today? You find me sitting in my living room in Florianopolis, which is an island off the coast of southern Brazil, a wonderful place. And uh, probably the big difference is that for you, I'm going to say good morning, but for here, it's almost midnight. I've just gotten back from my uh, my nightly soccer game. I'd start to pant at any point during this, uh, this conversation. <laughs> I, I didn't realize it was almost midnight. Wow. That you, I, I think, thank you so much for taking the call at such a late hour. Wow. This is what us global uh, global innovators do, right, I guess? You are the executive director of the Shine a Light Foundation or the Shine a Light organization. And I met you as a part of a United Nations Alliance of Civilizations event that we were both a part of. And, um, I, you know, I wanted and instantly interested in not only the work you do, but how the work that you do has specific impact and um, how it's very different than most of the people that we've talked with on this uh, on this podcast, you know, and, and, and how it approaches development work and, and situations of conflict, etc. As we always do, why don't, why don't you start off by telling us about Shine a Light and sort of its genesis and, and where your focus is today? Well, about almost 20 years ago now, uh, I was uh, doing a doctorate in classical languages at Harvard. It's not the general path that leads to social change work, um, but I hated it. It was just not what I wanted to be doing. So I went up and started to work with street kids. I worked in Santa Fe, worked in New York, and that actually gave me all of the intellectual stimulation that I was not getting at Harvard. Because when you're talking to a 16-year-old kid who's living under a bridge, he or she really wants to know what life's about. Because otherwise, you might as well just kill yourself. And so that gave me the challenge to think about philosophy and, and to talk in ways that I really wanted to. A couple of the friends that I'd had at Harvard a couple of years later gave me a call and said, look, we've been seeing these terrible statistics from, from UNICEF that they're talking about 40 million street kids in Latin America. We've got to do something about that. You've lived in Latin America for a long time. You work with street kids. Why don't you work on this with this? And so I took on the job of uh, executive director of China Light. But what I insisted with them was that 
you know, generally when people at Harvard or at the Sorbonne or at the UN think about development, they do it as, you know, we have a solution here and let's go and we will teach all of these people in uh, southern countries about how we're going to do it. And so what I insisted on is instead of doing a traditional development model, what we would do is the time when the Internet was just beginning to emerge uh, in, in Latin America, about 1998, 99, 2000 was that we create a network of organizations that they could teach each other. Not that we would teach them, but that we would be able to facilitate the, the technology for that to happen. And so the next six years, I just spent them traveling to every major city in Latin America, pretty much every country, meeting with the people who worked with street kids, with other marginalized kids, and creating that network. And that's how Shine Light emerged. By the time of 2006 or so, it was the, the biggest network of, of organizations serving marginalized kids around Latin America and had, had some really important impacts, uh, changing policies in several different countries and especially helping different groups to learn from each other. So that was a, a tremendously productive process. So did Shine Light exist before you started building this network or was, was that sort of, as you were talking with your colleagues or your friends or whomever, and they said, look, you know, Latin America needs this, needs someone to, you know, give energy to this. Was this something you said, you know, you know, I'm going to shoulder this, I'll take it on, and Shine a Light has emerged out of that process? Right, Shine a Light emerged from that process. Shine a Light was created from the beginning as that kind of a network. Okay. It's right. changed since then uh, because we've addressed a lot of the problems that, uh, that we wanted to, to deal with back in 1997. So, Kurt, you know what? You've been talking about the work that you've done, and, and one of the things I find most interesting is that you were one of the few organizations I've ever heard say, you know, we've had successes and, you know, we've, we've evolved because we solved some of the problems that, that we wanted to solve. And so I'd love to hear more about that. Like, how is it that you've been able to say, you know, identify a problem, go and have an implementation or go and have a, have a, have an intervention and then be able to say, yep, yeah, you know, uh, we did what we wanted to do and now we can move on. I think that one of the more interesting examples from the beginning of what we did uh, was that we worked with an organization called Taller de Vida in Bogota, Colombia. And it's an organization that was founded by refugee women, intellectuals from the countryside who were forced out by the paramilitaries. They came to Bogota, began to work with lots of kids, and they saw that the way that the school system saw refugee kids was as poor things. They don't know anything. We've got to help them. And that was really very different from these women experience because they knew that if you're growing up in the countryside, there are loads of things that you understand that a kid in the city doesn't understand. And so what they were insisting on is that these kids were not, shouldn't be the objects of remedial learning, but really could be kids who could teach other children. They could teach other children about geography because they had to come through the entire country in order to get there. They had to uh, – they could teach about the political conflict because they'd been the victim of it. They understood how it worked. They could teach about biology. They could talk about agriculture. And so it was a real reverse in the way that that was happening. All of that stuff was there. The ideas were there. And so it was knowing exactly how much emphasis to put in there, how to make a, a little step. Another issue is just the, the huge one of uh, street kids in Latin America. I started off saying that the UNICEF in the late 1990s was, was saying that there was – that there were 40 million street kids in Latin America. And that was absurd. There were never that many street kids in Latin America. But there were lots. We have been a part of a, of a big movement of lots of organizations that changed the way that people began to look at street children. We encouraged groups not to necessarily work directly on the street, but to work in poor neighborhoods, to think about the causes that make kids go onto the street, to think – that children go onto the street not merely to escape their homes, but also in order to find something else. And as we worked on that with governments, with a lot of NGOs, and also because fortunately there were lots of changes that were going on in Latin America at the time, economic changes, changes in demography, the number of children that people, that families have, the poor families have. And so, for instance, when I was first in, in Bogota, we did a, a, a census on the number of street kids, and it was a really good, really exhaustive census that found 30, 40,000 kids living on the street. There were lots. 2009 helped to do another one, and there were 60 kids living on the streets of Bogota. Huge, huge changes. And like I said, there's no way that we can take credit for that. But we were a part of it and played an important role in certain aspects. And I think knew where to put our fingers on which buttons. The way that you continue to, to describe Shine Light as, as sort of a network, as an organization that works with many organizations, this is something that has been tried time and time again, you know, the whole, the, the, the entire idea of just sort of a network of concerned actor, actors, you know, addressing problems that, that, that come up within that network. 
What's been your special sauce for making that work? Why do other organizations listen to you? Why do people give you funding? Why, you know, what is it that you bring that actually continues to make this network thrive other than obvious, you know, focus and energy? Well, because they don't listen to us. One of the things that was a real insight at the beginning was that we began to put people together and said, so for instance, I would end up in Quito and people would say, you know, the concerns that we've really got is that there are a large number of indigenous kids who are coming onto the street. They speak different languages, different cultures. We don't know how to do it. It was a traditional, say, Salesian or Catholic group that had worked with street kids for a long time, but had never worked with these indigenous immigrants to the city. And so we would say, oh, Look, there's this great organization in San Cristobal that has a Zapatista way of thinking about indigenous kids. Give them a call. The problem was that there would be 40 groups calling that group in San Cristobal, which is a disaster for that group. And so what we began to do is to work explicitly with the best of those groups that were, had a solution to common problems that many others dealt with. And then we turned that into DVD-based courses, CD-ROM-based courses, eventually movies and things like that. And that's how we moved into the next step. The reason that we were successful or that people listened to us is because they weren't really listening to us. They were listening to Melel Sojobal in San Cristobal. They were listening to Tayar de Vida. They were listening to Luciérnaga to be the Educación, the best NGOs around Latin America that we were collaborating with to put their, their knowledge into a way that could be shared with other, other organizations. You've mentioned DVDs a couple of times here in actually all three examples that you've put here, you know, and so far on the, on the, on our discussion, do you consider yourself a media maker? Is that what Shine a Light ultimately ends up becoming? I'm trying to sort of take us in the direction of looking at some of the, the actual products that you put out on the street, right? You've got films, you've got books, you've got other things. Is that where you are now gravitating towards or is that just kind of one in the collection of, of outputs that you guys put out there? That's where we're going. It first of all started off as a way for organizations to communicate with each other or for us to be a medium by which one organization would communicate with each other. And increasingly we found as the children and youth at the organizations that we were working with became the, became the protagonists in this process. So it wasn't necessarily me making a movie about this organization or me making a, describing the way that the organization worked, but the kids who had benefited, the kids who had participated in it and learned in it, talking about themselves and showing what they were able to do. And so began to see that the real power that arts had as a way for children and youth particularly, but marginalized people in general, First of all, to see themselves in new ways and then to show themselves in new ways. And so then as the number of, of homeless children really dropped dramatically in Latin America and we needed to find a new mission, that became the new mission. It was that of how is it that we can be a catalyst so that marginalized kids, whether that's in indigenous reservations, that's in favelas, that's ex-child soldiers, how it is that they can show themselves and see themselves in a new light. Give me a, your favorite story of, of one of these digital projects, uh, you know, where a youth has, who's participated in this, where they've, they've told a story, it's, it's gone out there to the world, and that's either come, you know, through some feedback loop, come back to them, and, and you know, it's been a catalyst for their life, or it's, you know, you, where you just sort of watch the change happen, or you've watched the outcome. What's your, what's your go-to when you're about to have a beer with somebody? <laughs> Uh, there's so many different ones. W one of my favorites is, um, it was a very short project, actually. It was in, in Córdoba, in Argentina. Uh, we were working with a group called La Luciérnaga, which is a wonderful local NGO. And what they did, it was a, a magazine uh, written by and then sold by uh, homeless kids on the streets of, of Córdoba. And one of the young men, a boy with the nickname of Lala, had grown up on the streets, very difficult, hard scrabble life. But by the time that I met him, you know, it was excited doing well. He had worked in the, the magazine. He'd made enough money that he had a, an apartment with some friends. Things were going well. And I said, well, let's make whatever movie that you want. And he made a, a movie that he called The Tunnel. Because when he was a street kid, what he would do is that he would rob ladies' purses, and then he would dive into the sewers, the, the storm sewers underneath the city. And no one was going to follow him there. So he could just go, go three or four blocks underneath, emerge in another place. And that was his life for, for many years. And so what he did is, fortunately, I didn't do this with him, but he took the camera and just went into those storm sewers that he had lived in for many years and, and worked in. And then he used this as a metaphor for his life about 
going into one place for one reason, and then discovering when he was coming out that he was a different person. It was a, a really, really profound reflection about what it means to change yourself, to transform yourself. He's not a religious guy. And yet at the same time, there was something profoundly theological about it. The movie went on to win several awards. It was named the, the best film at Cortopolis, which is the Argentine National Short Film Festival. And I think more significantly, because of, first of all, the process of making the movie, Lala talks very often about, he would, first of all, took the camera in and then did a voiceover while he was looking at the images that he had created. And then, of course, he would go and he would watch the movie again. But there's th this mirroring process where you're, you're, look, you're breaking yourself up. You're looking at yourself as an object and then transforming yourself as a subject that really made him, he says, into a different person. He's now uh, a relatively famous artist, uh, singer in Argentina. His band travels the whole country, um, and he's doing really well. He's got a beautiful little two-year-old daughter who I met a couple years ago when I was back in, well, a year and a half ago when I was back in Argentina. And, um, you know, it's just, his life has gone well. There, there's something wonderful about making movies and looking at yourself which I think is, is an even more profound form of personal reflection than psychoanalysis or therapy or, or philosophy. It's, it's sort of a, a way that people from the margins of society can think about themselves and think about who they are and who they can be. Thanks for that story. That was, that was super powerful. The thing that it triggered in my mind is it, it's a beautiful story for one person. What's the opportunity to scale that kind of impact to a, a larger population of indigenous people or, or people in the favelas or whatever? It, I'm sure you've thought about this. And so, yeah, one person having this huge experience and obviously this fantastic outcome from this particular project, how do we then translate that in some sort of scalable fashion to you know a, a large number of people? Right. And I think that that's the danger of telling stories. I love telling stories. And one of the powerful things about movies is that they are storytelling. We also do comic books. We also do uh, novels and things like that. And the, the story is wonderful because it really touches people. But if you're going to think about social change and register an impact, you have to do it in a very different way. So I'll tell a, a, a more generalized story about how those things work and, and what we've learned from the process. In uh, 2011, my wife, uh, who's also my co-director and uh, just a brilliant anthropologist, my wife and I went to Hasifi, which is a city that we'd been working in for a long time. He did, did her doctoral research there on, on young street artists. And we'd been contracted by the Bernard Lanton Van Leer Foundation to understand two things. First of all, what was it that took young people into gangs? And secondly, what were the community forces that those communities had not that came from outside, but really the, within the communities itself to resist violence. And it was fascinating. After many, many conversations with gang members, ex-gang members, kids who were thinking about joining gangs, it became clear that there were two reasons that they, they became involved in the drug trade, and none of them were about money. The first one was about justice. They said that they had been Revoltada, revolted literally, but um, they were furious at some sort of injustice very often that the police uh, had killed their parents, that the gang from the other side of the, of the river had killed their brother. The sort of injustice is that if you're in the favela, unfortunately, you have to, to suffer through all the time. And the second thing was that they wanted to be recognized, that they wanted to be seen. And when you're behind the walls of the favela, you're not seen. You're invisible, especially in a place like Recife, where literally the favelas are divided from the rest of the city by high walls. That invisibility is really, really heavy thing. And we talked to many young people who were involved in the drug trade, and they said, look, I understand. I really understand that I'm not getting either of these, these two things. I'm not going to get justice, and I'm not going to get recognized by joining a gang. But it's the only choice that I've got. It's the only alternative that I have. And so what we began to think about is, how can we theorize the situation? And we developed the idea of the economy of prestige. When we think about the economy, we generally think about it in financial terms. There are certain scarce resources which are bought, bought by money. How are those resources distributed? But what's interesting is that in the favelas of Recife, which is a very, it's a very different world from many, many places uh, in, in, in the rest of Brazil and certainly from the United States where I grew up. but it is prestige and honor are really limited resources. There's not a lot of it. Because of those walls that are there, 
because of the way that people see the favela, there's a really limited number of, of eyes on them. And so that resource of, of, of prestige is limited. And what's odd is that it's also passed on. So if a little kid wants to have prestige, if the, drug, the, the leader of the drug gang looks at him and admires him and says, oh, you're playing soccer really well, or oh, I like that hat, he's passing it on. So in fact, the dynamics of the prestige economy are very similar to the dynamics of the financial economy in the favela. There are certain resources that flow in. In the favela, with, with money, it's some people who work outside the favela, some people who might have a pension, really not very much beyond that. And then the money circulates inside. And the same thing happens with prestige. So once we developed this idea of the economy of prestige, we thought about how is it then that we can challenge this? How is it that we can transform this economy of prestige so that perhaps young people won't necessarily have to go into drug gangs to be respected? So this would, in the end, reduce uh, homicide rates. Well, something just a, the question that, that pops into my mind. I mean, I, I think it's fantastic to recognize these limited resources, right? I mean, prestige is is a, is a, this is a new one for me? I, I haven't heard of it, but there's certainly other limited resources, in either emotional context or strategic, whatever, that have been used in this in this sort of economic uh, paradigm. Is that recognized by the players in the favela? I mean, that they can see this and it's a tangible thing to them, or this is this is something that everybody just does subconsciously. They recognize it as a zero-sum game. So they understand that if I win prestige, you lose it. If you win prestige, I lose it. Mm-hmm. And so it's that's all or why, yeah, okay, get it. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's why issues of envy are, are really important. There's a the, the way that they describe it though is that they would talk about the the crab culture and they'll say that it's it's as if we're crabs in a bucket. And any crab that's going to try to get out, the only way he's going to do it is going to be by stepping on other people's heads and all the other crabs are going to try to pull him back down. <laughs> okay. Um, You've already given me so many visuals in this 20-minute conversation we've had that it, that's another one. That's fantastic. Okay. It is. So, I mean, and that's a, a metaphor that comes directly from the people in the favela. They talk about the fact that we live in a crab culture. The idea of the, the evil eye is also really important there. And the evil eye is effectively when somebody has more than I do, it is the, the sort of spell that I cast on him to make him feel bad about it. It's the envy that I throw at him to like the claws of the, the crab to pull him back down. So the question that we had was, how is it you can you can challenge this? How can you can, can you deconstruct this this perverse economy of prestige where if, if kids want to be recognized and they want justice and you know who are the kids who want justice and who want to be recognized? The most driven, the most creative, the most interesting kids, the the leaders who the favela really needs, and they're being drawn into that. It's also really important to recognize that this isn't something strange. Hegel when he talks about what is the motor of history, says it's to be recognized. It's the the struggle for mutual recognition. And so it's not as if we're talking about something strange. It's just that we have a really limited resource of, of recognition there. You've stumbled upon something that is timeless. I mean, it's not it's not unique or, or individualist, you know, individual situations. I mean, this is, you can apply this everywhere. Sorry, Absolutely. finish your story, but I, I, I sort of have a follow on to that. Sure. No, we'll talk about the consequences of that later. But what we did is that working with the Van Lair Foundation, we developed Favela News. And what Favela News is, is it's a group of, of young journalists from the favelas who Hita and I have trained in the basics of journalism and filmmaking. And three times a week, they make stories about what's good in the favela, about um, a little girl playing marbles with her little sisters, about a really good street vendor who everybody laughs at as he sells water on the street, about the soccer team that just won a championship. You know, really basic stuff that most of the time we don't think is important news. When I was at a high school or in, we learned about human interest stories and I thought, oh, that's not important at all. That's not what matters. What matters is the big things about the world. And, but in fact, it's those basic things that teach all of us what matters in life. What we learn from the media is that what matters is when you kill other people, because that's what gets on, or what matters is when you get dragged away in handcuffs, well then, that's the, the life that ambitious kids are looking at, and that's where they're going to go to. And so what's happened is that as we make stories about these different things, there's a different set of resources flowing into the, into the favela. And I think that there are two different things that are going on. You can, I can talk about it in terms of an economy of prestige, but it's also to a certain degree an ecology. If you're looking at wolves in, in Yellowstone National Park, you know that they're going to be where the rabbits are. And if all the rabbits are in one place, all the wolves are going to be there. 
But if there are rabbits in lots of different places, then you're going to have wolves that are distributed around in lots of different places too. And so that's been an important aspect of favela news, which has been to show that if you're 12 and you're 12 years old and you're dreaming about being recognized and being seen and being somebody, well, then there are lots of ways that you can go after it. But I think the second thing that we've shown is that recognition is not necessarily a zero sum game, that it's not that the traditionally recognized people in the favela are losing recognition uh, because favela news is there. It's not that the gang leader suddenly isn't prestigious anymore. He isn't important, which is really good because if he were losing prestige and saw that that was our fault, then they would come after us. I was just going to say, you'd be in trouble if you weren't growing the pie on that one. Right, exactly. And so that's why it's really important to grow the pie. That's what happens is that we're not growing the economic pie. We are growing or not financial pie or the money pie. What we're doing is, is growing the prestige pie. And especially because at this point, there are 200,000 people who see a favela news video each month. And when the favela news reporters show up at a, uh, at a community event, people just are all over them. Oh, you know, let me show you this. Let me talk about this. You know, my brother really plays a mean game of, game of pool. Oh, uh, my sister has done this great rap song. Would you record her? And so you can see this process of change of who are role models, what are the dreams the kids have. One of the first stories that the young men, uh, at the very beginning, it was only two young men, and now it's two young men and two young women. But at the very beginning, they went to another favela, which was actually a rival of theirs, of the gang that controlled their own. And they started setting up the cameras, and they noticed that there were a group of, of women behind them, and uh, they were looking at them, the two Young men, Okado and Adriano, started to get worried. Oh, no. Is the gang coming after us? What's going to happen? Let's, get, let's be careful. And eventually, uh, one of the, the women came over and said, I'm sorry, but why are you here? Nobody's been murdered. Which just says something yeah. really awful about the expectations of what matters. The only time that the social gaze should come upon us is when there's violence. And the transformation in that, that now when Favela knows, News goes into a community that it's never been in before, people come up and say, oh, let me show you this really cool graffiti that my, my third cousin just painted. There's an important change that goes on there. How can you apply this to I, I have two streams I want to go down? One is how your access to not only the Internet, but obviously social media outlets and whatnot is transforming this economy of prestige, right? Because the outlets are multiplying in, in what seems to be an infant nature, right? So the pie is growing exponentially. But then secondarily, can you translate this to Chicago? Can you put this, you know, in Moscow? Can you, you know, take this to the, to, to South Sudan? Does this, have you been able to make this model work elsewhere? We've actually talked to people from Cure Violence. They were in Hasifi, the invitation of the, the city government to, to talk about conflict mediation. And so we had some interesting conversations about this. Their sense, and I have a certain doubt, it's hard to know, but that their sense was that in a city like Chicago or like Medellin or like Kingston, Jamaica, cities where crime is really organized, where there's a hierarchical, very rigid gang order, that it may not be the economy of prestige that's driving these things. It may be much more about the way that organized crime generally works. Recife is a city where, where gang violence is really anarchic. Most of the gangs are very small. They are limited to one community, often one alleyway, and they fight among themselves. And so there are a lot of small gangs, uh, as opposed to Rio, where there are effectively three really big gangs, and Sao Paulo, where there's one and then a couple that are eating around at the sides. And so there are different things that are going on. I think that if you would look in cities where you have similar dynamics that bring children into gangs particularly, and the way that things are related, you would probably have certain success. In other places, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's hard to know. We're now trying to work at, at thinking about the economy of prestige when it comes to indigenous peoples. We're working in the Amazon on that. But we're really a small organization, Heat and I, and then maybe 10 other people. So it's just, we're small. We're experimenting and seeing what's going on. It sounds like Favela News is really having an impact. It's really one of the things, to, basically two questions here. One is, why was it favela news that came out of your brain or you know the, the collective brains of everyone saying, hey, the, here's the opportunity. I mean, the economy of prestige needs, what does it need? Does it need a news magazine? Does it whatever? And favela news came out of it. And then ultimately, what's been the 
what's been the impact that you've seen from it? You know, you said 200,000 people are watching this every month, but what has been the reduction in violence or what's been the reduction in, in strife, essentially? Well, the first question about why it emerged, I think a certain amount of that has to do with our own interests. Heat and I really enjoy making movies. We'd, we'd been doing that for a while. Uh, right when we started Favela News, we had just come out of a project making uh, making a movie with ex-child soldiers in Colombia, another uh, telenovela, so soap opera with indigenous kids in Bolivia. And so that was in our mind. But also because the way that social interactions work in Hasifi, and this was all about Gita's uh, doctoral dissertation, is that it's, she call, talks about an aesthetic sociality, that people come together in art. And by making art as movies, we were able to do something that would sort of build on top of that, including capoeira and maracatu and uh, afoche and all those sort of, of things that were there. The, the second issue about the consequences of it has been surprising even to us, I think. When we did the research for the cartography of the favela, the homicide rate in the four favelas of the north part of Recife, where we were working most carefully, which is a, an area of maybe fifty to 60,000 people, but the homicide rate there was almost 600 per 100,000. And just as a rate of comparison, Baghdad during the Gulf War was 300, and Chicago right now, or Detroit, is about 60. So there were just horrible, horrible homicide rates. Holy smokes, that's, yeah, that's huge. Mm-hmm. It was um, much worse than pretty much any uh, wartime situation that you can imagine. And Favela News isn't working alone, um, or it's not only working with video. We also had a, a series of, um, of events which would bring people from different favelas together, where, for instance, we would show the movies from, that had been made in one favela to the favela on the other side of the, the wall or the other side of the river, which had traditionally been its rival. Uh, we would also do parties where we would bring the two um, groups together so that the singers and rappers from one f- community would play to the other community. Everyone would dance together and, uh, and have a chance to have that aesthetic sociality. And also, we worked really intensely with gang leaders to resolve conflicts before they got bad. We had found out during our, our research that a large percentage of the murders happened as revenge killings. And so if we were able to stop that after one or two, that it wouldn't have the whole chain. And we also worked with the police in order to change the way that uh, the policing happened, to reduce police brutality, and so therefore to reduce the need for, for revenge on the police and um, for the whole dynamic of fear that, that happened around the, the favela. But all of that leads to the conclusion, which is that after several years of this work, of particularly working in the economy of prestige, but also conflict mediation, police, and, uh, and aesthetic sociality, the the homicide rates in those four favelas right now is less than 10 per 100,000. It's just gone through the floor. And this during a time where the rest of the city has had a really uh, dramatic increase in homicide rates. So the rest of this, the rest of the state really has had an increase in homicide rates. And so you can show that there's something really is important has happened when you're dropping from 600 to less than 10 homicide rates in these favelas. We got something right. And like I said, that was really surprising to us. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's super cool. So so take me to that that next step of how does social media change this for you? How does does it provide you with a whole bunch of more outlets? Does it does it provide? You know, is this something that the, the the youth that you're working with they recognize that they're like, wow, we can really attach ourselves to this, and these this is there's these opportunities, there's these outlets out there that they can then take and run with, or has that been more of a, a conundrum? It's definitely something that to this point. There are lots of people who've been able to run with, and Favela News has made really great steps with social media. I think that there, something that I'm really trying to think about right now is what social media means in general for politics. And that's a much bigger challenge, because I think that there's something about social media which promises fame and then doesn't quite deliver. And so in the same way that back in the first days of, of email, you would get one great email, and then you would say, oh, yeah, when's the next one going to come? And then you would turn on your, your email every five minutes. And there wasn't another interesting email. And nope, that one is interesting. And then the, the expectation of social media is, is that it's going to provide our, everyone is 15 minutes of fame, but then you get that 15 minutes of fame and you want more. And so there's a certain fame inflation maybe that's going on. And we haven't had that in the favela yet, just because the level is, was so, so low and that any recognition is positive. But at a certain point, I think that we have to think about 
the the expectations of recognition that happen on social media and whether or not that has anything to do with the new populism and new fascism and that's just something i'm beginning to think about and so probably not best not to think about have too many questions because i don't have any answers to them right well I'm, I'm just wondering you know you know you sort of scratch the surface there you you point us in the direction of the new populism the new fascism and and definitely how we seem to have these culture wars happening in the united states and in europe and other parts of the world where it's really you know culture of identity or politics of identity and i'm wondering do you see a place in this storytelling in this in this sort of favela news paradigm or, or structure that can speak to that, or uh, is that just that, that's not even in your purview? I think that we do. I don't like I said. I don't really have any answers, but I think that the most important thing is that there's been a connection between recognition and outrage on social media. It's not just oh, I really I'm really excited because this comment that I made got retweeted 15 times, but you are rewarded in certain ways for your anger. If you look at the things that get lots of of, uh, of a draw on Facebook, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as anyone, is when I get really mad at something that, uh, that Trump has done or that Michelle Temer has done, then that gets lots of hits. And so I think that there's the, the dynamic of, of recognition with outrage that comes together. And what Favela News insists on, and which I think is really important, is telling those positive stories so that recognition is associated with doing good things. And I think that if we think about it in terms of an economy of prestige and where you're running after, you want to be recognized, you want to be seen. If we're recognized because of our outrage, that's really negative. Whereas if we're recognized because of the fact that we're caring to our grandmothers, that's a great step. I'm not sure the way that social media can be tweaked to make that happen. But within Favela News, the success of Favela News has been about that. It's not because we have such a big audience. There's another similar project in Rio, uh, which is also news about the, the favelas, which has even a bigger audience. It's a bigger city, but it has an even bigger audience. But the way that they've made that audience is largely by showing where the cops are going to be invading, talking about the drug wars, giving those sort of details. And so it's prurient. It's almost pornographic. It doesn't challenge the basic expectations, even though it changes who it is that's recognized and who it is that's being recognized. They're still being recognized for the violence. Mm. One of the things that I can't get over now, and I've, I've done an experiment myself of, of trying to get out of the bubble of, of one type of, you know, one media feed, which maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn into a podcast here at some point. But I've just noticed the sensationalism of every headline, of every article, even the most mundane thing now has to have some sort of explicit, explicative, whatever that word is, you know, or superlative in the, in the headline to, to make it stand out, to make it seem like, oh, it's so shocking, so amazing, even though we're just talking about, as you said, you know, grandma got out of bed. I feel like there's something really important there that we haven't, nobody's really started to address yet. Maybe you have a thought on it. I, I was just talking to a friend who is a, a specialist in, in advertising and, and especially viral marketing here in Brazil. And he was talking about a, a seminar that he'd been with the people of O Global, which is the big media conglomerate in Brazil, very right wing, frightening, but also brilliant media conglomerate. And he said that they have an entire team, which has the sole purpose of just searching through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, and finding out what are the key words of the day, what are the things that are the most important, and then they mash them up, and they put them on the headline because that's where the money comes from. And that's that's frightening. That's what we have to deal with in a certain way, I think, in the big picture. Up to this point, we've talked about successes. We've talked about you know some pretty awesome things that have come out of, of Shine a Light. What's your biggest hurdle? What are, your, you know, what are the, the things that you continue to butt your head up against in terms of your practice, in terms of being able to move the organization forward, in terms of just sort of seeing results? What are your biggest frustrations? I think that the biggest thing is scaling, how it is that one takes these individual lessons and makes it into something bigger. Because I, I went to elite universities in the United States, my friends from college were big people in the Obama administration, they're in the Ford Foundation and the United Nations and so forth. And there is something about that really big picture, which is important and yet so superficial that it doesn't touch people deeply. And yet at the same time, the stuff that we're doing is really touches people deeply, I think, but at the same time, does it in such a small group of people? I mean, even if we're talking about uh, what's happening in the favelas of Recife, that's still 
a medium-sized city in a huge country in a huge world. And so that, those issues about scaling, and I, I go back to, to Max Weber and his thought about how it is that one institutionalizes charisma. And there's something very similar that goes on. We've thought a lot about how it is that you could implement a new favela news. We've consulted with other organizations that are doing, are doing similar stuff, other youth collectives. And yet at the same time, there is something that is really particular about it that has to do with individual people thinking through individual problems. And so that conflict between the particular and the universal is is a really hard thing to think about. And I mean, putting that in those terms, again, we're going back to Hegel. How is it that the one resolves a relationship between particular and universal? It's not something that we're going to resolve. But that's the thing that we have been thinking about really hard. How is it that one can make larger social change from these perspectives? Not that I'm criticizing in any way the fact that we've made a, a really important change in the lives of so many children and adolescents and, and adults in the favelas of Recife and, and others around Brazil. That's fantastic. But at the same time, it would be wonderful if we could figure out a way to think about that in a, in a larger scale. Mm-hmm. I really appreciate your commentary on that. I mean, the, the thought it jogs in me is, you know, we know that it's only, you know, the only thing that ever made a change is, you know, that small group of people, right? Or that one person who decided to stand up one day, right? What I wonder is, we are confronted in the humanitarian and development world essentially constantly now with donor expectations, with um, societal expectations of scale. And I'm wondering if we have it wrong just simply because we now know that there is enough of a groundswell of interest in the social sector of contributing to the the localities and where we live. If the real emphasis needs to be on deep impact right around where we're standing rather than coming up with the next, you know, Facebook for development, right? Just listening to your stories about deep impact in what we would consider smaller situations Rather than being able to affect hundreds of millions of people, you're affect, you know you're affecting thousands of people, but affecting them very deeply and having real change. Perhaps there's a, an important argument to be made for having that as the paradigm. One of the crises right now in Latin America is where is the next generation of organic intellectuals, to use Gramsci's term, but where are the people who come from the margins who are going to be leaders? Where are they going to come from? Because a generation ago whether that's Hita, whether that's me, a lot of people who are now in their 40s, we grew up in liberation theology. That was what uh, what inspired people. Marxist priests fighting for social justice, fighting against the dictatorship, and that really was a way that leadership got developed. Another way that, that it happened in the 1970s and 80s in Latin America was through union movements. But Pope John Paul II and, then, and, and Ratzinger killed liberation theology, it's been replaced in the favelas of Brazil and lots of Latin America by for-profit churches. Neoliberalism and the Washington Consensus has really done a job on trade unions. And so where are those people from the margins who are going to be the next generation of leaders, who are going to think in different ways, who are going to challenge the way that we consider the world and look at the world? Where are they going to come from? And that's a real challenge right now, I think. One of the things that we're really proud about is that when we did a, a, an evaluation of our, our first decade of work, Something like 72% of the the kids that we had worked with went on to become leaders in their community. And 42 went on to become artists in some way, shape, or form, to to earn money from their art in some way, shape, or form. And I think that that shows the impact of working on that deep level. At the same time, we're not talking about huge numbers. And so, again, there's the question. um, How is it that they are going to develop into leaders? And unfortunately, I think that the the contemporary way that we're thinking about development, which is wonderful to to think about impact and evaluations and uh, really to turn it into a business. But when you look at the people who are doing that and thinking about that, very seldom are they people who who grew up in desperate poverty. There's something different there. So that's another challenge that I think that we have to think about. Just a couple more questions for you. But one thing that we haven't touched on is how you stay afloat. You're a small organization. You're spread all over Latin America. What are your funding streams like? What I mean, are you out there on the stump? You know, as a part, you know, a major part of your job to to raise funds all the time, or is this something where you've been lucky enough to bring down some big chunks of money that you can you know, move your projects forward without really thinking about it over over several year year long periods, or is that just sort of a, a constant thing that you keep in the background? It's kind of constant background noise. 
if I were presenting to the school foundation or something like that, I would say we're lean and mean, which basically just means that we don't pay. <laughs> so we don't have a very big budget. We've had the really good fortune of having support from the Bernard Van Leer Foundation, which is a, a great foundation, flexible, smart. It's out of the Netherlands. And they've supported us for a long time. And then on top of it, there is we've had the, the very good fortune that because uh, I went to these elite universities in the United States, I know a lot of people who are now very rich, and so they have been. Uh, that provides a, a pillow of support at the bottom of it. That, that private donations, mm-hmm. but very fortunately, I don't have to spend a whole lot of my time, and neither does Hita, on fundraising. We spend more than we would like, like everybody does, but fortunately, we still get to do the the creative work and the the social change that really that makes us happy. Mm. Two final questions for you: Who do you pay attention to in order to you know stay fresh? Are you truly out in the bush there, and you know you're listening to the kids that you work with? And, and that's your source of information, that's your source of inspiration, or, you know, do you also, you, know, you got Twitter feeds you follow, do you have uh, magazines you read or newspapers or anything that you'd like to point out to our listeners as saying, you know, here's my one or two sources that I think are fantastic? I think there are a couple of things. One is that I make a real point of reading people that I disagree with. It's really easy to get into a, a group think about this. And so I've recently been reading Austrian neoliberal economists. It's important to think about that. Not that I agree with them, but it challenges me. It makes me think about things in different ways. I also studied philosophy. I studied classics. And so I spend a lot of time keeping up on contemporary philosophy. I read a lot of Zizek. I read a lot of Badiou and keep reading Kristeva. And that, I think, is actually really important in terms of, of what we do to keep challenging these ideas. And we did a, another project recently with indigenous peoples in the Amazon. And it was really important to have that philosophical background to put in dialogue with the philosophy of, of Amazonian people. It made it possible to think about it in, in different ways. The final question I ask is always, um, you know, is there a particular innovation, technology, process, organization, something that you, you know, we haven't talked about that's not necessarily directly connected to Shine a Light that you think is just super cool and, and, you know, people should pay attention to that you'd like to, you'd like to sort of give a shout out to? You know, a group that I have been learning a lot from recently is Wakiponi Mobile, uh, which is a, an organization in Canada that teaches uh, video to indigenous peoples. And it's not so much that they have something to teach in terms of methodology or what they have to teach is just inspiration, that the the quality of the video that they make in these participatory workshops with, with indigenous youth and uh, young leaders and shamans, it's beautiful stuff. And I think that that's a great thing is to be challenged to do something that's, that's more beautiful, that's more perfect to, to see that you can make something that's really fantastic. That sort of a challenge is great. We just finished with Favela News, our, uh, our first full length feature movie. And we've been challenged by groups like Wakaponi, by other uh, organizations that are doing Vigio Nas Aldeas here in Brazil, that are doing participatory video but really at a professional quality to make things that are really good. And because of that, the quality of our work has just become much better. Uh, the movie was just just opened at Cine Las Americas at a festival in the United States, just won a big prize in Los Angeles. And that has to do with the dialogue and the challenge and the inspiration that we get from organizations like them. Kurt, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today, especially so late at, time, at night there in Brazil, and hope that this will be the, just the beginning of the conversation for us. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's been a pleasure. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. I'd really appreciate your support. So if you find value in this conversation with Kurt, can you give us a five-star rating right now? And if you really like it, why don't you share it with other people on Twitter or or Facebook? And of course, you can always send us a question at 8preneur.com. Thanks. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from 8preneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes.